And our next speaker is Stuart Reid. Stuart, well known to Garden History Society people, chair of the Sydney and Northern New South Wales branch of the society and um, very active and very energetic. Stuart's background is as a horticulturalist and landscape architecture and he works with the government on Australian, world, national and New South Wales heritage areas, particularly seeking better understanding and management of landscapes as opposed perhaps to, um, to just buildings. Stuart's passions are learning the lessons of diversity from historic gardens and finding old trees. Stuart this morning is speaking to us tree success stories and strategies from New South Wales, Victoria and Spain. Please welcome Stuart Reid. And thanks very much for the invitation. It's nice to come south again. Welcome to Braidwood and a rather dull day. Braidwood's a little country town halfway between Canberra and the coast on the tablelands. I once went to a very depressing talk about growing trees and shelter belts on farms in the tablelands and how many pests and diseases can eliminate every effort of yours to get anything to grow. So this is a miracle to have a tree on the tablelands. But this is a couple of stories, good news stories from New South Wales where rat bag community action or changing mindsets have had a good outcome. And one of them involves New South Wales roads, I'm delighted to, to suggest. Uh, it's not an everyday occurrence. And that's Braidwood. We're in reconciliation, we've just had National Sorry Day and we're in Reconciliation Week, so I'm rather proud that this photograph, staged though it was, is in this talk. It's always in my talks, but look at everything attached to those persons and, and everything those persons are doing. Uh, and try and tell somebody that trees or nature is not you know, fundamental to an Aboriginal person about place, about food, about fibre, about weapons, about tools. This is Lake Macquarie, this is an estuary north of Sydney. Trees matter to Aboriginal people and they always have. Some of them are totems for tribal groups. And I love this, a couple of elderly Aboriginal persons observing an elderly eucalypt with a, with a shape in it. You know, what's going on in this picture? Um, that's, a, that's a book I've stolen, someone else's cover. But so many uses, so many associations or links, um, affection between people and trees. Marking sites where you do initiations for young people or marking sites where you bury old people, absolutely fundamental to life's journey and daily life. Not just ornament. Sydney's northern suburbs, like some of Melbourne's I'm sure, are noted for leafiness, bollocks. Here we are in 1903 getting new street trees by community protest because they were sick of the dust and they wanted you know, some dust control. So reluctant little Karingai council puts in brush box trees which are doubtless heritage listed today and fought over every inch. You know, but they weren't always like this. So old photography is very good to look at to say well how old is that? When did that happen? Oh it's not in that picture. Aerial photography similarly it may not have been like this, or it might have got like this for a jolly good reason, and what is that reason? Dodgy photo looks a bit like a digestive tract. It's um, some of the more desirable housing at the end of the water pipe in Burwood, upper, note, upper Burwood. Uh, and notice the name, Ponzi Roman, you know, Appian Way. Middle, upper middle class housing, but notice the trees. This is the brush box, a rainforest tree from the borderlands of Queensland, marching up a Burwood Street, giving you a desirable suburb, a desirable address. It's a million and a half to fart on that street now. <laughs> I would suggest, uh, you know, perhaps that should go in the Brisbane study. With, you know, private tennis court in the middle of the green and so on. Garden suburbs, what are they? And what's the role of trees in them? as opposed to other product on the market. This is nothing new, this sort of thing. Here's Edna Walling having a rant in the local rag. Well, actually, not the local rag, a local magazine, Home Beautiful, in the 20s. Is Melbourne slaughtering its elms? An ongoing debate. But Greg's point about the bozos, not having a thought about where the truck goes, the bozos doing the clipping, oh, I'm just clearing the wires, I've got to do this, this is the regular Australian standard, so, you know, nothing new at all. Probably you can't read this, doesn't matter, it's on the web. 
This is a, a fashion chart uh, about types of uses of street trees, where, what and when, over time in New South Wales. And it just makes the point that for private avenues up the top, 1788 plus, we were using things like gums, olives, citrus, oaks, Norfolk Island pines and pines. And over time, shade trees in towns, country roads, marketplaces, when we got local government, which wasn't there from the beginning, it came along later, 1850s, 1880s, they planted street trees, when and why and what. Trees are subject to fashion amongst everything else, clothing, <laughs> housing, and that's changed. Why do we put them in? What's an appropriate street tree for an 1880s suburb? What's an appropriate street tree for a 1920s one? Different, useful. One of the problems, as already been pointed out this morning, is shrinking space. Sad to say, part of my job is documented and destroying, um, well, observing the destruction of, of rural Western Sydney, because we're building, building two Canberras in paddocks north and south of Sydney and swallowing up farmland. And, and any sense of that it was farmland before the suburb came along is, is the challenge. So this just makes the point, these two pictures about where farmhouse homesteads were sited on the top of a hill on the side, often marked by trees, often areas, not always, um, and how to retain any sense of that. You know, put a local park around the old house or put a school. Or where can your open space go in the new suburb? How much open space? Is there any open space? Enough of that. Here's Braidwood from the air. Un unusually, it's a town, and perhaps the first town listed on the State Heritage Register in New South Wales. That was a five-year battle, which I won't bore you with. The sky, the sky will fall in. My life is open, uh, is over. I won't be able to paint a fence. You know, heritage tourism's gone up by, I think, 500%, and the locals are quite quiet now. They quite like heritage. The, the, white, the white line is just the boundary of the listing, and it's a dodgy boundary. It should have been a circle, actually but it's more to do with the approach roads to Braidwood from Canberra, which is bottom right. No, sorry, top left is from Canberra and to the coast and from the coast, which is bottom right. Uh, it's a Georgian grid of a town, a military grid dropped drop down in the middle of a, somebody's sheep paddock. It's a private town. But it's, it's listed in its setting, and that's important. So those approach roads, and particularly the trees along those roads, frame and introduce you to Braidwood and, and get the excitement level going up. And this story is about the King's Highway, 1936, planted to commemorate a, a popular king, King George V, along that road. Unfortunately, people being speed addicts and alcohol fond, there's been, I think, five deaths on that road in the last 10 or so years. So it was getting to the stage where something had to be done about trees and safety on that road. So that's what triggered this off. Um, New South Wales roads keep changing their name, but basically this is a, um, a little story of, about the way they went about it. What are those trees? Gold, a mixture of golden poplars, Canadensis aurea, here. Lombardy poplars, Nigra italica. And there's a little, you know, what's the problem here? And also pin, oak, pin oaks, which were put in later in the 20th century, sort of infill. Not all the trees did well, and some of them were replanted later. <clears throat> but pleasingly, um, New South Wales Roads came and talked to us, to Heritage New South Wales first, and said, well, what do you want? What do you need? What's your requirements? That's very rare to come and talk to us early, but they did, and we were quite stroppy. I think I was, I'd had my coffee that day. Um, you know, you must consult all the stakeholders. You must talk to the community about this. You can't just chop down trees and say it's for your own safety. You know, you'll have a riot on your hands, and they <laughs> nearly did, but pleasingly they did. So two or three public workshops, two or three drafts along the way, plenty of opportunity to air the issues, to hear people's pain or joy or whatever, attitudes, and to give people a bit of ownership of the process and the outcome, and a good outcome. But this is doing the analysis stage. Um, what, what trees have we got? Uh, what's the spacing? How far back from the road surface are they? What condition are they in? Do they need to be replaced in the next five years, 10, 20? All that stuff. Here we are, downtown Braidwood, uh, jostling with tourists. And you'll notice the lack of trees in the background. This is, this is the high country of New South Wales. It's perfect for sheep. It's not necessarily perfect for trees. And trees are quite welcome and usually quite deliberate when they're there. 
another one gives you the idea. Braidwood does have other trees, like I've just had an application to <laughs> prune around power lines in the entire town as an exemption, you know, as a minor application, I might add. Things like eucalypts and later fashions in the 60s and 70s went in, so it is a bit of a jumble. Oops. Yes, you see there's some blue gums and other local species, ribbon gums from the late 20th century. So, report number one, you know, what are the issues here? What's the road safety issues? What's the fatality levels? What have we got? What's the resource of the trees? Condition? What grows well in the southern tableland? Like, what will actually succeed here, given that it's probably not going to get a lot of watering, it's not going to get a lot of aftercare, it's going into fairly compacted, you know, it might be hit by a B-double truck tomorrow. This is not ideal conditions for new trees, OK? So what works well, what will work well? Um, what needs less, less or least maintenance? Big issue for a public authority. Limited money, limited time, um, bugs, all that stuff. But also the bottom point, why were these chosen? Now, why, why is a poplar of this shape important? Not necessarily an oak. What's it doing? That, so that word fastigia just means upright, like an exclamation mark. Deliberate choice of that species or that form to do that job. RMS is Roads and Maritime Services. Pleasingly, they did this stuff. What do we want to do? Let's talk to you about it. What would you like out of this process? What do you value about these trees? Exemplary, you know, uh, consultative approach. And genuine, I think, you know, they realised they'd have trouble if they didn't, but genuine approach. So all this stuff, we'd like to go about it this way. Here's some options about how we can replant, how we can replace. This might need to be done in stages, not whack them out all at once. What's ideal? Can you live with that? Is there a role for the community to come and plant, to come and maintain, to help council out, because council doesn't have bottomless pits of money? Um, local groups, local um, rotary, school kids, you know, opportunities to get partners involved. And then, too small to read the caption, sorry, but you get the idea. Now, what goes in where and when, most importantly? Having to change and increase spacings back from the road, having to level out, you know, there's culverts and there's other sort of traps, death traps along that road, so there's also lots of private driveways and lots of private ownership farms butting up to the road, so chatting to, slowly to each of those owners about what trees are on private land, what are on public, how can this happen effectively? And then this stuff, spacings, actual species selection and actual spacings, and safer spacings. Also, retaining existing trees as long as you can, because the, you know, they're very much the heritage item of the avenue. Uh, it's not a war memorial avenue, but it's certainly an, a commemorative avenue. But planting inside what's there, and, and trees don't like shade from other trees, so getting new trees to, to grow in old avenues is sometimes difficult, less so with deciduous tree. Too much detail, but you get the gist, right? And also, not every bit of road has the same speed. As you come to a town, you slow down, so 80 k, 90 k's to 80 to 70 to 50. So that means you can play with spacing a bit, you have a bit more leeway, but being clear about that and avoiding pitfalls. You know, this owner needs a truck to get into that driveway, it needs a bit more width, or get a tree away from that corner, etc. Details. Blah, 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 blah. I'm very pleased to show you this photo because I didn't have this a couple of years ago. This is poplars propagated from the, those poplars in, the, in pots in a nursery ready to go in. So we're getting past the theory and into the practice stage now. So to me, you could say, what a dull photo, but I think that's a very exciting photo because seeing new trees going into old landscapes pleases me immensely. That's what we're not doing enough of. But also this stuff, writing it down, you know, getting around the bozo factor. How do we ensure that we get 100% or 90% survival rate? How long do I have to look after that tree afterwards? What does look after mean? Do I have to water it? Pruning, you know, staking, all that stuff to make sure that you don't just put it in, but that your investment actually comes off. Site preparation, soil, you know, how much, what comes in, mulch, all that stuff. Nailing it down so there's no shadow of a doubt and costing it. Want to know about that? Check out their website. I think you'll find that RTA now becomes RMS, but you get the gist. Uh, and then they have a regional approach. So this is the South Eastern region, and the King's Highway is the magic word. 
check it out. Another piece of uh, good news comes from Tamworth, from the Central West. If you're an Elvis fan, you'll know about Tamworth. If you're not, welcome to it. This is the old main road from the east, from the coast, into town. Lower Naminga Road, it's called. Thanks to a uh, flood, um, the bridge has gone out, so it's now no longer the main road. There's no bridge to get across the Peel River, and the road became what's called the Armadale Road or the New England Highway. Uh, it got diverted, but same thing, same king, same time, 1930s, same function. So loved that the locals fronted up, put up the oaks, put them in. It's on a floodplain of a river, gets occasional floodings, so absolutely ideal. Rich soil, silt, uh, you know, fantastic oaks. It's actually not just, it's an L-shaped avenue, which is <laughs> a bit unusual. Here's the site of the bridge that isn't. It was under threat because council were just doing a little shady deal about growing Tamworth on that edge of town and doing rural residential subdivisions and can we just widen that road and just get in 59,000 driveways and oh well I'll just have to take out this tree and that and perhaps the whole thing will have to go. Uh, sorry but mate, the, the community got a bit upset about this, they're very fond of this avenue, they like walking on it, cycling on it, riding their horses, it's not necessarily a public park but it's treated like one and uh, they didn't put up with that. It wasn't a heritage item, so very pleasing. Here it is under flood. Notice the power lines and notice the vital asset, which is doubtless costed and you know, budgeted to death, being maintained, and I've had plenty of uh, ongoing issue, is power lines. However, look at this, the power of uh, the web and modern technology. Um, there was a school teacher at the, at the middle of this um, movement and, and she's pretty savvy and, and she made good use of the web, good use of mobile phone technology, talked to all her mates, got stuff in the local paper, really turned council around by using an online campaign to say, hang on a minute, we're not happy with this, we love this avenue, we'd like to keep it as long as possible and perhaps it should be a heritage item. So here we are on the front cover of New England Country Living with a darling little girl hugging an oak tree. Here we are, plugging on local boys like Troy Cassar Daly, who's you know local Elvis, and like Keith Urban, married to you know who, using whoever they could to raise that, make that point that, hang on a minute, council, you represent us, we love this, we want this to stay. It worked. Online signatures, can't argue with that. They all vote, they all have, uh, you know, pay their rates, they all uh, uh, take an interest. Here they are, we're not happy, Jan outside the local council. It's now a local heritage item. It's now a state heritage item. Isn't that fantastic? Very little finger lifting from me. But with a lot of this sort of thing, Tamworth City News, not stumped by lack of action. So it worked. And I'm rather pleased about that. I've pinched photos off all the, the above you know, websites and whatnot. Here it is going onto the register. I, I don't know how it happened, but I you know, gave lots of secret round the corner help to the nomination and anyway it happened. Activism should start young. I love this. This is my local rag in Sydney, the Wentworth Courier, a quality read. But here's the you know the local mayor of Waverley Council brought to its knees by ankle biters. Because we don't want our paper barks out of our childcare centre backyard. Childcare centres I can tell you are not the friends of trees, but this one is. And don't you love it? Look at those little faces. They're gonna grow up to be rat bags. Trees are incredibly important. I mean, this is a garden, which you would know well, on the World Heritage List. And you know, yes, it's got a nice building by somebody called Reed, I'm pleased to say, in the middle of it. That's not the point. It's got a park around that building, and those parks have disappeared worldwide. And that's the point. That's why it's on the list. The setting. Where do you go for stuff? I often deal with arborists who love the word safety and love the phrase safe, useful life expectancy. Good on them, that's core business. How long will this live? Is it safe, is it not? When does it have to go? But they don't like the word significance. So a lot of what I do is talk about why does it matter? How old is it? Who planted it? Who does it matter to? Should it be replaced and with what? I.e. significance. Um, there's a lot of stuff on our website. I've probably mentioned all that already. But this bottom point, what next? Policies. Yes, we know it matters. What do we have to do? And when do we have to do it? I love policies and I love verbs, you know, conserve, replant, propagate. Think about what next, because 
trees will die, storms will happen, uh, you know, things come along. And I'm, we're all dealing with a lot of this. Wisdom and f investment of the past that's coming to the end of its life, for whatever reason, drought, neglect, just good old, old age. What do you do? When does it have to go? How does it go? What happens next? This is my problem, uh, this word significance, and getting beyond condition. Condition's one thing, and safety is one thing, and risk, and we're all obsessed with risk because we're all very quick to sue when we trip over or you know, have an incident with a tree, and some people have been killed by trees, let's be blunt, but perhaps people are more at blame than trees. But this point down the bottom, you know, is it significant? Should it be on a list? What do I do next? What does that mean? Do I have to keep it? Do I have to replant it? When and with what? Should it be replanted further, further away if it's too close to something and a bit of a risk? Pleased to say this was exempt, couldn't care less. Well, I'm thrilled it happened, but this is replacing some dodgy oaks on the Governor's Drive in Parramatta Park, a World Heritage Site that's a stone's throw away from my office. Was oaks, I'd rather that a Mediterranean oak like Canariensis had gone in rather than Roeburg, because they do a lot better in dry Western Sydney. I lost that argument, but the point is, here's new trees in an old place. Fantastic. And it happens, you know, you would know this place well. Cypress Hedge got a bit out of control, same gardener forever. Here he is, hanging on to the grim end. Point is, the society's paid to get that propagated and replaced. And it looks a bit odd, a bit open now, but fantastic. They put it back. They didn't put back colour bond or a nice solid concrete retaining wall. They put it back, same species. That's what we need more of. What can councils do or what can governments do? All of these sorts of things. And these are vary between legislative tools that actually are compulsory or, you know, have some teeth like planning overlays in Victoria, or, and policies, significant tree register or tree protection order are just individual trees or collective, anything over three metres tall, anything with a trunk diameter. Um, they're policies to say we encourage, we would like to keep, they're not requirements. And LEP is our equivalent of your overlays, local environmental plan. That's just a New South Wales bit of slang, DCP development control plan. That's a guideline that can be overruled. Um, so LEP is our magic word, north of the Murray River. I'm sorry to say these trees have gone, but this is when you're beating your way away from Woolworths and Mona Vale on the northern beaches with a shopping trolley. You have to do a slalom around the local gums. And I like that. I think the engineer lost that argument. Um, unfortunately, you know, due to whatever, ground changes and water, they're gone now, but isn't that marvellous? Here we are in Barcelona doing a little bit of Australian botany. In Catalan, P is pine. Barcelona is determined to have more trees on every street than any other European city or perhaps any other world city. They'll do it. They're extremely determined and can do the Catalans. And they're bi or trilingual. You know, if you care and look down between the cracks in the pavement, you can learn. Fantastic. They don't actually tell you this is saving you 1500 bucks a year. That could be a little, you know, Wi-Fi addition to this, but lovely little detail. And here we are doing a little bit of carving back um, good, uh, do you know what the phrase lot perimeter housing means? Like keeping the middle of the block like a donut free. That was how the Echample, which is a 1900-ish part of Barcelona, was settled. Buildings around the outside like Paris and then hollow cores. So you could have a garden, so you could have a clothesline, so the kids could run around without being killed. Buying those back, that all been filled in, that all been lost. So slowly they're getting those green spaces back. Fantastic. Why not more of that? Not just on the roof. A lot of councils are picking up this idea. Now, Melbourne's been a leader, I have to say, but it's spreading like a virus, good thing. Um, UFP is just urban forest uh, policy. Here's a few New South Wales examples. This is good. Orange City Council have done a master plan on trees and better still surveyed the community about what they love about the landscape or the streets or the parks of that district. Very much part of trees and they've put it all on the web. Fantastic. If you haven't seen that, check it out, significantscapes.com. Here we are in Valencia in the south of Spain doing a brand new uh, ecological park in a very grungy, working class, boring chocolate brick apartment block suburb uh, that speaks all about water management, water systems and history. 
because that's the rice bowl of Spain, that's where paella, the rice, comes from. Water management and manipulation is absolutely part of Valencian history. And here we are learning about it in an environmental learning centre in the middle of a public park with a library and a dog park and children's playgrounds and smooching couples in the corner, different areas to do stuff for different people. And shock, shock horror, they talked to the locals about what would you like in a park and then did it. Surprise, surprise, it's popular. Here I am banging on about verbs again. Uh, you know, a conservation study is useless unless it tells you these sorts of things. What do I have to do or what does they have to do and when? Especially the last one, propagate and replace. Big issue for ageing uh, landscapes. There's a few good things on our website, I'm pleased to say. That thing I showed you with the fashion chart, that's where you can find it. We did a street tree guideline for New South Wales and a history quite a while ago. The Land and Environment Court, of course, deal like your VCAT, deal with a lot of disputes. And Judy Fakes, who might be well known to some in this room, is now not a teacher at Ride TAFE, but she's now a commissioner of that court and an expert on trees. Judy's put lots of lovely stuff about dealing with your neighbours outside the court system, you know, a bit like marriage guidance instead of divorce. Um, have a look at that, that's fantastic stuff. And also this, the Institute of Landscape Architects in 2005 had a forum like this about urban trees and about managing urban trees and came up with a bit of a charter. Um, that's worth checking out. A few master plans I would recommend that if you haven't seen, Centennial Park and Sydney are very good about tree management. So are the Rocks and Circular Quay, which is managed by a government agency called Sydney Harbour Foreshore Authorities. They've done a tree management plan. It's an urban, you know, warehousey kind of built up area, but they have trees, a lot of them recent since the 70s, and they value them, good stuff. And down here, trees can kill you, and here's something I'm proud to have been part of, you know, bunya pines and managing those cannonball cones falling on you. you know, yes, you can just fence it off and wait until they've finished dropping and perhaps, you know, shift your childcare centre or your car park or your vital infrastructure a bit further away from the fall zone or, heaven forbid, just wait until the risk is over. That's what that's about. This society is a terrific resource and a growing resource, I'm pleased to say, on trees particularly on avenues. That's some, a project we've had for a while now is echoing what treenet.org.au are doing, is documenting avenues of honour or memorial avenues around the country um, and putting them on the web, you know, asking the public for input and, heaven forbid, doing a bit of advocacy. Perhaps this one's dying, perhaps this one needs replanting, perhaps that one needs heritage listing, talking it up. ICOMOS is the International Council on Monuments and Sites and they're basically writing down how to do good heritage practice. So if you've heard of the Borough Charter, good on you. But if you haven't, that's the Bible in terms of best practice heritage management internationally, actually. It was sorted out by Australians in a tiny little copper mining town called Borough with very few trees. I'm hoping we're not heading for this because we're building this and you've seen some cracking examples around the country of this this morning. Spot anything above knee level in that picture. And what can a child climb apart from a, you know, a video cabinet to get to the top to the remote control in this landscape? And what would a child learn about nature? At least it's got a little bit of nature in it, but imported, exotic and antiseptic, I would suggest, if they have the bravery to get out of air conditioning to experience it. That's pretty woeful. And that could be Los Angeles, that could be outer London, that could be anywhere. It doesn't speak to you, the South Pacific or Aboriginal people or local. This is not exactly exemplary, but at least it has street trees on it. This is an old hospital at, the co at Prince Henry Hospital at, at um, Little Bay, the bottom of Sydney, putting in new housing. It's no longer a hospital, but using local trees. Tuckaroo in the foreground, coastal banks here in the back. Tiny little nature strips, but at least there are nature strips. Um, it's better than nothing, right? And it's also local, so it tells you a little bit, and it might, heaven forbid, attract local birds and local fauna. We haven't learned anything much since the 1920s. Here's a couple of Americans, Chicago-based Walter and Marion, Burley and Marnie Griffin, doing a better way of doing nature in the 20s on blasted sandstone promontories in the north of Sydney. And notice the lack of housing visible or the ratio of housing or built fabric to non-built fabric in this picture. Wonderful. And have we learned that lesson? Sparely. I hope that was of interest. I wanted to also mention 
the Dendrology Society, which is not a, a disease, it's dendron, is Greek for tree, logos is Greek for study, um, have a bumper sticker called Think Trees, Grow Trees. Uh, not a bad idea. If you're interested in bumper stickers or just Google them, dendrology.org, if you're interested in a bumper sticker, Helen Page is your best friend and might even wave her hand in the air. I think she's got a few. Um, we're out there and we should be propagating ourselves. Thanks very much. Thank you.